Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Brown with the CORE Institute, and uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you guys tonight speaking about knee injuries in the athlete. Um, obviously, we've been here in the Phoenix area for a while and, and have taken care of uh, multiple, uh, multiple knee injuries in the athlete, so um, I thought it would be a good idea to step in front of you guys and, and give you some more information about that in a little bit more of a, a formal fashion as opposed to sitting in the middle of a clinic room. So. With no, without further ado, the athlete. So what is the athlete? So the athlete is defined by Merriam-Webster as a person who is trained or skilled in exercises, sports, or games requiring physical strength, agility, and stamina. Um, we just got finished watching the uh, last dance, and I'm sure a lot of you guys have watched that as well. So that's a picture of Michael Jordan, obviously, and uh, probably the ultimate athlete for sure. So, but who else is the athlete? Is it our wake surfer, our soccer player, our high school football player, or the mom and dad, the, the, the dad and daughter uh, ski duo there, uh, both of which have sustained their own ACL injuries. So there's just a little tidbit about us. But at uh, any rate, we've been through it, and uh, I think everybody out there watching um, is gonna be interested in this talk, and we're, we're gonna talk about some of these uh, tears or some of these injuries in, in the athlete. So the objectives tonight, um, not to sound too classroom-esque, but uh, the ob objectives are to introduce injuries that commonly occur in the active population, to outline the clinical presentation of the injury, to discuss the diagnostic workup, and to describe the treatment options for each type of injury. And we'll go in depth on each one. So the common injuries of the knee that we're gonna uh, discuss tonight are the meniscus tear, the anterior cruciate ligament tear, and injuries to the cartilage surface or the articular cartilage injuries. Hopefully we can get through all, through all of them um, and we'll do our best to get, uh, to get there. So the meniscus is essentially a hinge joint, I'm sorry, the, the knee is essentially a hinge joint formed by the femur bone and the tibia bone. And there's a diagram down here that I have my laser pointer on. So the femur bone uh, connects down here to the tibia bone and it just forms a simple hinge joint. Um, the meniscus is a thick rubbery piece of cartilage that cushions the joint. So where this blue area is here, that's the meniscus. And that's the, the cushioning of the knee, uh, the knee joint itself. So the knee, the meniscus provides a shock absorber type of effect between the two bones. And it also serves to add some stability to, to the joint. So when we run or jump, land, twist, or cut, this meniscus is cushioning the shock between the femur bone and the tibia bone. A lot, of, a lot is expected out of this meniscus and sometimes there are problems. So the meniscus tears can occur acutely. In other words, it can occur, uh, occur all of a sudden, um, such as bending down and you go to pick up something off the floor. Sometimes they occur during a soccer game where you twist your knee and you can feel that pain on the inside of the knee, or, or it may be an overuse injury. They can occur in isolation, meaning that's the only problem, or they can be associated with a more severe injury, such as an ACL tear. I always talk about the meniscus as being kind of a weak point in the knee. It's kind of the, it's the vulnerable structure in the knee. Um, and that's really based on its poor blood supply. Um, and blood flow is essential to heal. So what happens is, is, if there's a small tear that you may not even know about, that tear then becomes a bigger tear. And then those bigger tears can then displace, and then they get caught in that hinge joint. And that's when they cause a problem. It's the primary shock absorber of the knee and is subject to daily wear and tear. And that is obviously increased in the athletic population. So we're kind of pushing the, the limits to the function of our knee as we, as we go through these act athletic endeavors. The symptoms are generally localized over the region where the meniscus is located. And usually it's associated with pain. And there's are mechanical symptoms, as I discussed, when that meniscus tear displaces you can actually get these catching and locking uh, symptoms in the knee, and we call those mechanical symptoms. There's also an associated swelling of the knee that occurs quite frequently, and that's based on the irritation that that meniscus causes. It creates irritation in the knee, and the reaction of the body is to produce a little bit more fluid in the knee in response to that, uh, in response to that injury. So that's what we call a knee effusion. In this specific diagram, what we're showing is, is where patients generally will place their hand when they show me where their knee hurts. And so for the medial meniscus, that hand is placed on the inside portion of the knee. And for the lateral meniscus, 
they'll place their hand on the outside portion of the knee, and that's usually directed to where, that, where the side of the meniscus that's been injured. The symptoms may be present for a while. I mean, sometimes that athlete will, be, will tend to play with the injury until the pain becomes consistent, and that affects their level of participation. In other words, they're, they're out playing, and they're playing on a, you know, a Friday night uh, softball league, and every time they swing the bat, they'll feel a little bit of a twinge, and then one given Friday, they swing it a little bit harder. Next thing you know, their, their, their knee locks up, and that's when they decide that they're gonna come and, come and see a surgeon. They can hurt at night. Uh, a lot of times, that's, patients are kind of confused by that, but the, the inflammation patterns actually worsen uh, towards the evening, and that's, that's when a lot of people will complain of that, complain of that pain is during, uh, before they go to bed or actually interrupt their sleep. The mechanical symptoms of catching and locking or the pain that the tear creates then brings them to the surgeon for further treatment. In other words, I just can't deal with this anymore, doc. I need to, I need to do something. And I oftentimes refer to this as the pebble in the shoe phenomenon. In other words, at some point in time, that pebble in the shoe just gets so irritating, they just want to get that pebble out of the shoe. As Muhammad Ali states, often it's not the, ma not the mountains ahead that wear you out, it's that little pebble in the shoe. And so um, the, the picture of the diagram of that lady stooping down is walking through a subway station and she's trying to catch the train and that pebble in that shoe is just driving her crazy. So she's got to bend down and pop it out. And a lot of times that's the same thing with the athletes. They just get tired of that, that pain that's interfering with their activities. And finally, they come see someone to take care of that problem. So the treatment of the, for a meniscus tear, generally the patients will come in and they'll, that begins with a clinical evaluation and x-rays. The x-rays that you see up on the, uh, on the screen are normal x-rays, uh, no significant arthritic change. And the exam that's being performed there is isolating the medial meniscus where the physician's hands are along the medial joint line of the knee. And the knee is being placed in a position that will exacerbate the symptoms or make worse the symptoms if there is, in fact, a meniscus tear in this individual's knee. If a meniscus tear is suspected, then an MRI may be ordered. Uh, the physical findings that increase suspicion are, again, tenderness over the medial joint line, uh, which would in indicate a medial meniscus tear, or pain over the lateral joint line, which it would indicate a lateral meniscus tear, and often there's an associated swollen knee. The swollen knee is not, not consistent, uh, if that meniscus tear has been, been there for a while, sometimes that swelling initially occurred when the meniscus tear happened, and over time the swelling goes away, uh, but then the, the individual is left with, with pain uh, over the affected meniscus. An MRI specifically is a study that evaluates the soft tissue structures of the knee that's not otherwise seen on the standard x-rays. Patients often ask me, can you see the meniscus tear on my x-rays? And the answer is, I cannot see the meniscus tear on, on the x-rays, we would need an MRI to see those. The soft tissues of the knee, specifically the meniscus in this discussion, uh, can be seen very clearly on the MRI, and that's why we get the MRI to further evaluate it. The most critical portion of the exam is the history given by the athlete, and I call this the first five. In general, the, in, within the first five minutes of, of speaking to the patient, we kind of have an idea of exactly what's going on. And obviously, we would get an MRI to confirm it. But the questions that I ask are, well, what are the symptoms? How did the injury occur? Where does it hurt? What makes it hurt? And what makes it better? And by evaluating the response of the patient in regards to their response to those questions, we come to the conclusion that that most likely is the problem. If the MRI confirms the tear, a treatment plan is developed. And this is actually a pretty nice MRI uh, for you guys to see, so when you're when you get the disc and you take it home and you pop it in your computer, what you're looking at here is that this is the end of the femur bone, this is the top of the tibia bone. The meniscus is a uh, dark uh, triangular shaped structure. This is the anterior portion of the meniscus, so the front part of the knee. And this is actually the posterior horn of the meniscus. And you can see a white line that clearly goes through this meniscus, and that's what indicates a tear. And there's also a small fragment right in this area here as well. So that is a very clear representation on an MRI of what a meniscus tear looks like. If we see that when the patient comes back, we evaluate the MRI, uh, and then we discuss options. 
So in general, in terms of treatment, if the pain has been there for a while, in other words, it's been there for several months, is relatively tolerable, and the meniscus is not displaced, in other words, it hasn't shifted in the knee, then you can consider conservative treatment. Conservative treatment would be uh, corticosteroid injection, and this, this is a, uh, generally a cor uh, corticosteroid that we use in the clinic quite often, where we place this corticosteroid in the knee. Uh, it's done through a small injection, and patients tolerate that pretty well. Physical therapy does help. It strengthens the muscles and ligaments around the knee that, uh, that help with stability of the knee um, and allow a lot of folks to, to compensate for that meniscus tear. They learn protective maneuvers uh, to minimize the, uh, minimize the pain in the knee when they're during, during certain athletic activities. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are a hallmark of treating inflammation and they do a very good job of treating the pain from a meniscus tear. And finally, bracing a knee sleeve or a knee brace does help. Um, it doesn't necessarily stabilize the knee, but it gives the patient positive feedback in terms of where their knee is in space, and it does help them protect the knee uh, during activities. If the pain and symptoms do affect daily life, interfere significantly with athletics, or are associated with significant mechanical symptoms, then knee arthroscopy may, recommend, may be recommended. Again, we do evaluate the x-rays, and if there are significant arthritic changes on the x-ray, um, then we do not recommend arthroscopy, as in general, the arthritis is the main component of the pain. If there's minimal degenerative change, then arthroscopy generally will help with those mechanical symptoms. In regards to the specific mechanical symptoms, the catching and locking that occur within the knee based, uh, secondary to the meniscus tear, even if you go through conservative treatment and it doesn't solve the problem, what I always tell people is you can't numb up mechanical symptoms. In other words, if there's a loose piece of cartilage that's in the knee, no, no matter how many non anti-inflammatory medications you take or how much cortisone you put in the knee, you can't numb up mechanical symptoms. So when those are present, it's pretty clear indication to pursue surgical intervention. So what is knee arthroscopy? So knee arthroscopy involves placing a small camera into the knee joint. This allows visualization of the critical structures and components of the knee. And generally when I talk to patients about what knee arthroscopy is, is I say, listen, I'm gonna put a camera in your knee, I'm gonna see all the critical structures in, in your knee. I'm gonna look at the cartilage surfaces, I'll look at your, your ligaments, and I'm also obviously going to evaluate the, uh, the meniscus, and that's where we're gonna focus. But it's not just a study, it's not just a procedure that just goes for the meniscus. We actually are able to evaluate all the other structures of the knee and give patients really good sound feedback in terms of what else is going on in their knee following that arthroscopic procedure. Specifically, however, the arthroscopy does allow the surgeon to address the meniscus tear and treat the tear accordingly. So this is a general setup in terms of, it's a, a cartoon diagram of what those arthroscopy portals look like. And we're, we're able to put a camera inside the knee joint here, and then over here on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, this is the, the typical arthroscopy setup with the, with the leg draped over the side of the bed, and then the camera's uh, in front of the surgeon. So you're actually operating here, but your visualization is up on the screen. Um, it's a nice big screen. Uh, the video, video of, the, of these arthroscopies is pretty impressive these days, and we can see, see things with very fine uh, fine definition. In general, during the arthroscopy, the meniscus is e either trimmed out or repaired. Um, I generally, uh, generally say that most often the torn portion of the meniscus is removed. In other words, the pebble is removed from the shoe. In some instances, the meniscus can be repaired, and we generally reserve this for younger patients. Um, typically, it's what's called a peripheral tear, so it's on the outer aspect of the, of the meniscus where there's still good blood, blood supply to allow effective healing of the meniscus. If the tear can be repaired and it fits the criteria for repair, I will fix it. And I, I really kind of focus on the younger, our younger athletes that sustain meniscus tears. Uh, even, if it's, even if it's a tear that um, is a little bit questionable, as much meniscus as we can leave in the knee, uh, we leave in the knee. So, as I stated on that last statement, keeping as much meniscus preserves the longevity of the knee, as we know that that meniscus is the cushioning of the knee and also provides stability of the knee, so taking a bit out of it 
uh, uh, can uh, lead to uh, some earlier arthritic change. So this is just a, an arthroscopic uh, uh, representation of what that meniscus looks like. This is a young gentleman, a professional baseball player, um, that actually uh, tore his ACL. Uh, at the time of his ACL tear, he also tore his meniscus. So this is the cartilage on the end of the femur bone. This is the cartilage on top of the tibia bone. That's my writing. This is the uh, meniscus uh, tear right here. And you can see how when that meniscus, if it's torn, is going to basically be stuck in between the femur bone and the tibia bone, and that's where that's gonna hurt. After we take the meniscus out, this was a meniscus trim, this was a displaced tear that was not repairable, and this is what the meniscus looks like after we're all done. Again, here's the end of the femur bone and the top of the tibia bone. The surgery itself takes about 35 to 40 minutes. Um, it is an outpatient procedure and pretty very well tolerated. Uh, sometimes we can do these under a local anesthetic, um, but most of the time uh, there is a, a general anesthetic that is administered that allows for a very comfortable surgery. I think mostly in my younger patients, the, they do get a little bit worried that they're going to wake up in the, uh, in the middle of the surgery, and I, I assure them that, uh, that they will, will stay fast asleep. But even if they do, the knee's going to be pretty, will be numb, and they won't, they won't, uh, they won't feel anything that we're doing. So we start therapy about three to five days post-op. At about six to eight weeks, the general consensus is about 60, uh, sorry, 80 to 90% better. My general consensus during their post-operative recovery is just don't walk too much. If you go to the movies, get dropped off at the, uh, at the front entrance. If you go to the grocery store, uh, have your significant other drop you off at the front of the, front of the grocery store so you can do your so you can do your shopping and, and, and not spend too much time on the knee. I, I do recommend low impact activities during the first six weeks. Generally speaking, stationary bike is your best friend. Um, it's a low impact. The, uh, the revolutions that you turn the pedals are actually beneficial to the knee. They help the synovial fluid, which is the fluid inside the knee, nourish the cartilage and encourage healing of the knee and reduce the formation of scar tissue without an impact type activity uh, such as running or walking or those type things. Other exercises that can be recommended uh, that are recommended uh, are the elliptical trainer which is a little bit more of an impact type activity uh, and also a rowing machine is very effective in, in, uh, in stimulating the motion that's needed in the knee for full recovery. I do allow the patients generally to return to sport about six to eight weeks once, once symptoms have uh, diminished and they're able to get back to their, their sport. Um, there will be a period of time in which that knee will still be sore. Most of that's post-surgical pain, um, and that usually uh, lasts probably about, uh, probably about two to three months after the surgery, but it's something that you can work through as you return to your athletic activities. The next topic that we'll, we'll talk about is the anterior cruciate ligament tear, the infamous ACL tear. Uh, seems like every preseason in football, um, a, a, majority, a, a significant amount of the players go down with this ACL tear. Um, in, uh, during club soccer season, uh, it's almost endemic within the, within the soccer population where they're going down with ACL tears. So we, we see them quite frequently. We see them quite fre frequently in our weekend warrior um, athletes as well. Um, uh, Saturday morning soccer game or softball game uh, on Friday nights, we typically see these ACL tears. Um, the ACL is necessary for stability for athletic activities that involve a rapid change in direction such as jumping and landing. We don't see it a whole lot in straight ahead athletes such as swimmers, uh, joggers or those type things. Obviously we're not going to see it in swimming, but in jogging and, and, uh, and those type things we don't typically see ACL tears. The ACL is an intra-articular structure, in other words, it's located inside the knee joint. That's important because, uh, because of its location, uh, it's surrounded by the fluid inside the knee. The question that I get asked quite frequently is, once that ACL tears, won't it heal itself? It seems like everything, in, uh, everything else in the body can basically heal itself. What happens is, is once that ACL tears, the fluid that's within the knee actually disrupts that healing response. So it basically, it, it basically is, it falls within the substance of that ACL tear 
and doesn't allow the torn fragments to join back up and heal. And because of that, generally once an ACL tear occurs in our active population, then ACL reconstruction is necessary. The ACL is one of the four stability ligaments of the knee, which make up the ACL, which is the anterior cruciate ligament, the MCL, which is the medial collateral ligament, the lateral collateral ligament, or the LCL, and the posterior cruciate ligament, or the PCL. And this is just a diagram of those ligaments here. Uh, this is a cartoon mock-up of what that knee looks like. Uh, this is the anterior cruciate ligament. It's on the front part of the knee. The posterior cruciate ligament comes from the back side of the knee. The medial collateral ligament is along the inside portion of the knee. And the lateral collateral ligament is on the outside part of the knee. This is just a representation of what an ACL tear looks like. And in this live uh, picture here from an arthroscopic procedure, uh, this is actually the ACL, and it's a rope-like structure um, that, that connects the tibia bone, which is down here, to the femur bone, which is up here. And that allows, that's what creates the stability in the knee. The posterior cruciate ligament sits back here behind that ACL, and that's why they're called the cruciate ligaments, because they actually cross uh, within the knee itself. And they're very visible on arthroscopic evaluation. So arthroscopic, arthroscopy is a very effective tool of evaluating the status or the condition of the ACL. ACL tears generally occur by, non, by a non-contact mechanism. Um, so I'm a, uh, a Washington football team fan, and uh, I was very excited when Robert Griffin uh, Jr. Was, uh, was drafted by the, by, the, uh, by the Washington football team. I gotta make sure I say that. Um, and this is actually a, uh, this is his non-contact, this is a non-contact injury where he had a rapid change of direction. Um, dropped back for a pass, uh, fumbled the football. Uh, the football went one way, he was going the other way. He stopped, changed direction, and his knee actually collapsed into a valgus position, uh, and that um, uh, tore his ACL. It involves a planted foot and a rapid change in direction. They can occur from a direct contact as well, where there's a direct blow to the knee, causing the knee to buckle. If you can imagine a player otherwise coming down, this happens a lot in offensive linemen, where the, uh, where the offensive lineman is, has a stable knee and then a defender comes in and basically impacts the outer aspect of the knee, the knee buckles and the ACL, uh, and the ACL tears. The athlete, athlete typically describes a distinct pop. It's almost, uh, it's a very consistent uh, story in terms of how these athletes present. Uh, they'll say, well, I, was, I, wasn't even, I didn't even hit anybody. I was making a change of direction. My knee felt like it buckled and I felt a pop. Uh, the, other th the other description that, that people generally say is my thigh bone went one way and my shin bone went, went the other. And it's, uh, it's kind of a, it's a little bit of a, a freaky sensation and uh, patients definitely remember it. There's a little bit of PTSD with that, uh, with an ACL because it's a very distinctive uh, event. Um, some people describe it as if, like, my knee came out of joint. Uh, other people describe it as when my knee gave out, I felt a pop, and I immediately felt sick to my stomach. A lot of the athletes will go down, they feel, felt the pop, and, and they almost know what they did. Uh, it's such a, uh, a well-known injury in the athletic population that uh, they, they, they have a feeling that that's what, that's what happened to their knee. So immediately following the injury, the athlete may or may not be able to walk on the leg. Some people are just afraid to. They're just a little bit worried about, you know, what, what happened. Their knee swells up, um, they're sore, and they're just, they have a little bit of uh, a fear of about, about being able to, to stand on the knee. There's typically a rapid swelling of the knee. Most of the time, uh, there's a little bit of a delay in that swelling, but about an hour or two later, uh, the knee uh, fills with, what we call, it's just a post-traumatic response, and you can see this is a picture of an, AC, an acute ACL tear, and there's a significant amount of blood supply uh, to the ACL itself, so when that ACL tears, that blood supply is disrupted, and the knee itself fills with that resultant um, blood inside the knee, and that's, that's, that's where the effusion comes from. This is obviously a normal ACL, and you can see that traumatic event where that ACL is no longer present within that knee and it's been disrupted by the injury. 
The athlete, because of the severity of the injury, generally seeks medical, medical, medical attention, and we try to get these athletes in as fast as possible. Um, when I see the athlete in clinic, again, they typically present with a similar story of a change in direction, a pop, and the, then a resultant swelling in the knee, and of course, pain. X-rays are taken to evaluate the bones of the knee to make sure that there's no associated fracture or broken bones that would otherwise necessitate a little bit more urgent care. Uh, and also, uh, in regards to getting those x-rays, generally what will happen is the patient will come in, they're fearful to put weight on it, they come in with, on crutches, maybe a knee immobilizer, and as long as the, the, the other structures in the knee are, are uh, uh, check out, in other words, they look normal and the x-rays are okay, I will generally encourage the, the individual to go ahead and try to put some weight on the knee. Um, and then they usually can, with some coaching, uh, begin to, to put a little bit of weight on that knee. On physical exam, the knee is assessed for stability. Um, and the typical, you see the, the, uh, the team doctors go out on the football field, uh, the player goes down with a knee injury. And the first thing that, thing that they do, they allow the player to extend the knee, they lay the player back, and they perform what's called a Lachman's test. And a Lachman's test is simply a test that, that assesses the immediate stability of the knee. The other tests that we do, more often in the clinic situation rather than on the field, is a pivot shift test. The pivot shift test uh, is also in, indicative of an ACL insufficient knee. It's not really the most comfortable test for the, pay, for the athlete to be, for it to be done on the athlete uh, on the field of play, so we usually reserve that uh, for the clinic, uh, the clinic setting. So this is a diagram, uh, or a, uh, uh, these are some images of what an, a Lachman's test is. And so when the, if any of you guys have come in for, a, for an ACL exam or a knee exam, we generally will always evaluate uh, the ACL to determine the stability of the ACL. Uh, and what, what happens is, on stability testing, there's a feeling of looseness of the knee, and we refer this as laxity. In other words, the knee feels lax. This means that the torn ligament is no longer providing adequate support for the knee. And the specific test here, as outlined, is where the physician secures the, uh, the lower calf with their right hand, could be the left hand, depending on the knee, and then the left hand grabs the femur, stabilizes the femur, and then is actually pulling in this direction on the, on the knee. If the ACL is competent, in other words, if it's still intact, then there will be a specific resistance to that motion of the knee. If the ACL is incompetent, if there's an ACL tear, then you will actually get some motion of that knee relative to the femur. So you'll be able to pull the tibia forward relative to the femur, and this is kind of a live uh, uh, picture of what that uh, Lachman test is looking like. We grasp the knee with the right hand, left hand stabilizes the femur and pull forward, and we checked that uh, the competence of the ACL. To confirm the injury and to evaluate for any other associated injuries that may have occurred, an MRI is ordered. If there's any suspicion of an ACL tear, if there's an effusion in the athlete's knee um, and they describe the injuries as we discussed, we're going to get an MRI. It's just part of, the, it's part of the assessment. We don't make any assumptions in regards to what happened, uh, in regards to what happened to the knee. If the athlete desires to return to sport, and I'm sure most of them do, they, do, they, they want to get back, and that, I think that's the biggest, uh, that's the biggest challenge with, with making the diagnosis of an ACL tear is actually delivering the news of an ACL tear. Um, it's probably the most, you know, it, it just, it hurts when you, when you have to tell a 16-year-old soccer athlete that they're, you know, that they're going to be out for, you know, six to nine months after their ACL tear. It's a tough pill to swallow. Um, it's a tough pill for the parents to swallow, and it's always a little bit difficult for us to, uh, to tell them that that's what that injury is. But I always tell them that once we get that ACL fixed, the first day of healing is the day we fix it. So they understand the timeline, and they're ready, and, and they're, by the time we get to the surgery, they're, they're kind of pumped, and they're ready to get this ACL taken care of and get back into their sport. We know that ACL reconstruction is a well-established surgical intervention that does restore the normal stability to the knee and allows the athlete to return to the pre-injury level of play. 
Many times th this may be an in-season event where they're, the question is, is, hey, listen, you know, Johnny just tore his ACL. He's feeling good. Typically about three to four weeks after an ACL tear, uh, the athlete will come back and, and visit uh, and we'll, we'll talk and say, hey, how you doing? And they'll say, you know, doc, my knee actually feels really good. Um, the swelling's gone down, the pain's gone away. Um, I'm ready to, I think I can go back out and play. Um, and I, I typically discourage that. Um, but it's, it's sometimes tough to convince them. So there is, from time to time, a role in non-operative treatment. If they want to attempt non-operative treatment, then we counsel the athlete in activity modification, bracing, um, and we can supply them with an ACL type brace, which is depicted over here, physical therapy to really strengthen the leg, and reassessment following adequate PT to make sure that they are in fact ready to go back out on the field of play. I do emphasize that another pivot shift episode, in other words, where that knee shifts, just like it happened in the first place, with any kind of cutting, landing, or jumping maneuver, that that can damage other structures of the joint and further compromise the health of the joint. I've had several episodes where we've recommended surgical intervention, the athlete wants to go back and play, um, and they have another pivot shift episode where the knee buckles on them again, and now they have a meniscus tear or they have other cartilage damage in their knee, uh, which, which then compromises the long-term functionality of the knee and can lead to early arthritic change. Again, it may be reasonable for athletes that participate in what I call straight ahead sports, such as running, swimming, or biking. Um, for those sports, I mean, just to be clear, the ACL really isn't necessary. I, I don't like to say that, but it's, the, the stability of the knee is not really tested when you're straight ahead running, obviously not in swimming, and in biking. So those sports certainly can be returned to if that's what the athlete chooses to do. So operative intervention, uh, ACL reconstruction. Um, it's an operative procedure, obviously. It's done primarily arthroscopically. There are some other smaller incisions that, that need to be used for placement of the graft, uh, which is the tissue that we use to reconstruct the, the, uh, the ACL, uh, and also placement of some of the, the fixation devices. We call that placement of hardware uh, in the knee to make sure that ACL graft is, is fixed in the knee. It takes about an hour to two hours of surgical time. The goal is to anatomically reconstruct the torn ligament. The ligament is not repaired, but rather it's replaced with a graft. And those grafts can come from multiple sources, and I'll discuss that in a second. The graft ev eventually actually becomes the new ACL. So we basically put in a lattice uh, work of, uh, for, the ACL to to, for a new ACL to grow upon. So we put in what we call, it's a tissue, it's a structure called collagen, and collagen is a fibrous tissue uh, that makes up the tendons and ligaments. So we replace an, uh, a ligament, uh, the anterior cruciate ligament, with an, a type of tendon that then actually becomes a ligament, and that grows into the new ACL. And this is just a depiction of what a reconstructed ACL looks like. This is the graft through the center of the knee, and it's fixed in the femur, with a hardware device and it's fixed in the tibia with a hardware device and this actually suspends that graft and creates a anatomically reconstructed anterior cruciate ligament. Graft options, um, uh, there's autograft and allograft and I'm sure that's uh, something that you out in the audience have probably heard. An autograft is your own tissue. Um, for ACL reconstructions, I. I tend to like the uh, quadriceps tendon autograft. It's a very consistent graft that I can use. I get the same size graft every time when I use it. Uh, there's not a whole lot of variability of it. Uh, and, we can, and we can modify the size of the graft uh, according to the patient's size and structure. Again, it's the patient's own tissue. And once again, it's a predictable size and quality of the graft. When I'm doing an allograft, an allograft uh, as strange as it may sound, is actually cadaver uh, donor tissue. So we actually use cadaver donor tissue for the ACL reconstruction, uh, and I choose to use the Achilles tendon allograft. Other physicians will use different types of allografts. There's a variety of them there, 
uh, but a little bit more too in depth for this discussion tonight. But the cadaver is, uh, the allograft is cadaver donor tissue. I consider that more applicable in a recreational athlete. Uh, there's less trauma to the individual. So there's something called operative morbidity. And operative morbidity is actually the injury that, that has occurred, that has occurred to the individual during a surgical procedure. When we harvest a graft, obviously we violate a specific structure that was otherwise uninjured. And so we create an injury in one place to reconstruct an injury in another. So it, it's kind of like a, a, a double whammy for those individuals. So uh, in, a, in, a, in a recreational athlete that just says, listen, I just want to get back to, you know, Friday night softball or, or you know, uh, club soccer, um, I will typically recommend an allograft uh, tissue to those individuals. Uh, me being a case in point, I uh, had my ACL allograft done several years ago and been doing fine. So um, I have a little bit of uh, say in that matter. Um, so this is what an ACL tear looks like. So the top uh, diagram is once again, I showed this picture before, but this is an acute ACL tear. This is actually the tunnel uh, that's drilled in the femur bone. This is a suture that we use to pull the graft in position. Once that graft is in position, this is the new reconstructed anterior cruciate ligament. It's, it's attached to the femur bone uh, by, a, uh, by a device. It may be a metal screw. It may be a, a suspensory um, uh, piece of hardware. Uh, this is the graft itself, and that's an anatomically reconstructed ACL, uh, a very good result, and, uh, and ready to uh, face the physical therapy demands. So the post-operative recovery, I generally keep my patients on crutches for about two weeks. Uh, we do like to start physical therapy relatively quickly. Uh, the, the goal of physical therapy in the first six weeks is to really uh, create a quadricep tendon, a leg that actually functions. So you still want to get the muscles working again. It takes a little bit of time for that. The trauma of the ACL reconstruction sometimes in, in very simple terms, puts that leg to sleep. In other words, it doesn't want to, doesn't want to really want to work. And so the physical therapy is there to encourage uh, motion and use of that leg in a very early, uh, in, in an early phase. I like to use a brace for about six weeks. I generally have my patients walking by two weeks, but obviously they're still using the brace. The brace really is there for more of a, uh, a secondary, um, secondary stabilizer once we put the ACL graft in, it's about as strong as it's going to be as soon as we put it in. So the brace is just there for, for support. It supports the weaker muscles around the knee and allows the patient to get back to some normal activities at a relatively faster rate. Jogging by about three to four months um, and about five months, I do generally begin a return to sport protocol. Um, and that's where the athlete is starting to do athletic maneuvers uh, they're leaving the ground, they're landing, they're doing more balance training uh, and getting their leg ready uh, to enter back into sport. In general, we return to full sport at about seven to eight months post-op. Adrian Peterson kind of screwed all this up when he came back and played uh, football f uh, at, at his six month mark. But uh, honestly speaking, I don't know if, need, know if he really even needed an ACL the way that guy's built. But, um, in general, return to sport about seven to eight months post-op. I know that's a long time, um, but again, it's a journey. Uh, and you, you get back to some normalcy at a relatively quick, uh, at a quick time frame, at about that you know, six to eight week time frame. And then you enter into what we call the boring phase. And that's just where you're doing simple activities. There's no running, there's no jumping, there's nothing athletic but you're working towards that goal. So then by that five month mark, you can start to do, uh, do more athletic activities. And again, return to sport by about seven to eight months. The next topic that we'll discuss is articular cartilage injury. So articular cartilage is kind of a difficult concept for people to understand. We've talked about the ACL, which is the ligament in the knee. Uh, we talked about the meniscus, which is the cushioning in the knee. Now we're talking about the articular cartilage, which is the lining of the knee. It's the lining of the end of the bone. It's like a cap on the end of the bone, um, and it covers the end of the femur and also the top of the tibia. Um, it serves to create a smooth and gliding surface so the knee joint can bend and extend in virtually a friction frictionless environment. 
there's uh, something we call coefficient of friction, which means how much resistance is there to motion uh, between two surfaces when they rub together. The combination of articular cartilage and synovial fluid, which is the fluid in the knee, creates almost a frictionless environment within the knee. And that allows that knee to move effortlessly. And so you never even know you have a problem until something goes wrong. And when there are defects such as cracks or holes in the articular cartilage, that's when the knee can get painful. And that's depicted here. Once again, this was an ACL tear uh, individual uh, that actually sustained an articular cartilage injury to their knee. Uh, the surrounding tissue is the articular cartilage. That little pothole right there, uh, that's, what, uh, that's where that injury was on the articular cartilage. Injuries to the articular cartilage can occur acutely, such as during an ACL tear or when there is a rapid abnormal motion of the knee. And that basically, when, those, when that motion happens, the cartilage surfaces actually, for lack of a better term, they bang into one another. Uh, and then that's where, you get those, that's where you get those cartilage injuries. The injuries can also occur when the bone that supports the cartilage becomes loose and the cartilage and bone becomes unstable. And this is typically an injury in, in adolescence. And there's a weakness in the cartilage attachment to the bone. I apologize for some of the little bit of gore here, but this is the cartilage here. This is actually where that cartilage lifted off the, uh, lifted off the bone. And you can see the bone surface here. There's actually some attached bone still on this cartilage fragment. Um, and so that's, a, that's an injury that actually can be repaired. Sometimes they occur for no known reason, whether it's a genetic predisposition, whether there's a uh, previous injury that the patient doesn't, even, doesn't really recall, uh, but there's an injury to that cartilage that then um, creates this uh, issue where that cartilage just starts to peel off uh, the bone here. And so this is actually the cartilage peeling off the bone. This is actually bone back here. This is a little metal probe that we're using to investigate that articular cartilage injury. And once we clear all that up, we have this nice, uh, we create a nice round um, uh, defect here that we, can, that we actually can repair. Um, I always, I call this kind of the orange peel effect. Um, and that's where the cartilage literally peels off the bone as if that internal structure is the fruit of the, of the orange itself and that outer layer is the peel. And that's what's happening in this specific individual. The clinical presentation is typically defined by local pain in the affected area. There's generally swelling that occurs and mechanical symptoms of catching and locking. If you can imagine if you had that patient that showed that cartilage lifting off the bone, obviously it's not a, not a perfectly mechanical sound structure, and then you'll get those mechanical symptoms. The swelling occurs because it's, a, uh, it's an abnormal, abnormality within the joint itself, and that creates inflammation, which is the irritation of the tissues within the knee, which then result in the swelling of the knee. The treatment depends on numerous factors. How acute is the injury? Is there presence on the bone still attached to the cartilage fragment? And of course, the age of the patient. In the younger individuals, the healing potential uh, of a cartilage injury in a, younger, in a younger individual is certainly pretty significant. Uh, and certainly, we try to, to fix those cartilage injuries uh, in, the, in the young patient. The presence of the bone still attached to cartilage I'll show you how we fix those in a second. So this is, again, that acute injury with the bone still attached to the fragment, and we treat this with a procedure we call open reduction in internal fixation. In this, in this depiction, obviously, there's the injury to the cartilage, and what we've done here surgically is we've actually put these um, recessed uh, bioabsorbable bio screws uh, which hold the bone that are attached to the fragment and secure it to the underlying bone, and that secures uh, that fragment and allows those bone surfaces to heal, allowing that cartilage fragment to heal, um, and that preserves the uh, longevity of the knee. If that large piece of cartilage was lost, we're never gonna get cartilage back like that cartilage again. The body cannot, once an injury occur, once an injury occurs, cannot recreate normal cartilage. It actually produces what we call fibrocartilage, and fibrocartilage is a uh, tougher, less soft, uh, and less dynamically stable um, uh, surface. So we really like to preserve, preserve the original cartilage at all costs. If that's not the case, 
If we have more of this chronic injury and we have this kind of orange peel effect in this older, a uh, little bit older individual, then what we can do is we actually clear up that, the, the cartilage that's unhealthy. Uh, we actually poke holes in the bone and we call this procedure microfracture. Uh, people will say when, I, when I've had patients talk to me and they've had this procedure done, they said, yeah, they broke my bone to make the cartilage grow again. Not really. What we do is we create these small holes in the bone and what that does is stimulates uh, any of the existing uh, what we call mesenchymal cells and mesenchymal cells are cells that can come out of the bone marrow and actually form a scab over that, uh, over that defect and it actually will regrow that fibrocartilage that I, that I spoke about. In order to augment that, in addition to doing this microfracture procedure, what we do is in, in this specific instance we actually used um, some minced which is finely uh, ground uh, cadaver cartilage and actually put it uh, in the defect itself as well. That cartilage then fills these holes and then that cartilage acts as a scaffolding uh, for new cartilage cells to grow in that defect. It's a very effective way of treating this uh, difficult problem. So articular cartilage injuries is a complex problem. Um, there are several options for treatment based on the multitude of factors. If the cartilage loss is too severe, other options are available, but eventually joint replacement may be necessary in that situation. And that's all I have for you guys tonight. Kelly? So the goal of a meniscus repair is obviously to create a, uh, a repair that has longevity. Um, so there's no good predictor uh, on, on terms of how, that, how long that meniscus repair is going to last. Uh, a well-fixed meniscus in a younger individual will actually, will actually regrow and be just as functional as, a, uh, as the original meniscus itself. Uh, there are instances in which a meniscus tear is done and the blood supply may not be as effective as we'd like and that meniscus is more vulnerable to injury. Uh, again, that's a case-by-case -case basis. Um, in terms of the, uh, the time frame between a meniscus tear and when a knee replacement would occur, there's no way to really predict that. Everybody has their own genetic time clock in terms of the durability of their cartilage, and that's the articular cartilage that I referred to before. Some people's cartilage lasts them their whole life. Other people's cartilage starts to wear out, obviously, in their early 30s and 40s. Um, it's an unfortunate situation. Um, having as much meniscus in the knee, however, allows that articular cartilage uh, to maintain its longevity for as long as it's genetically programmed to do. That's a good question. Um, a meniscus tear, if a small meniscus tear, uh, that's probably clinically not even evident. In other words, you don't even know you have that tear. Um, can, does have the potential to heal. Uh, a meniscus tear that occurs in conjunction with an ACL uh, injury, uh, there are times when we do an ACL reconstruction uh, and we, it's a small tear and it's in a, uh, it's an advantageous position. Uh, sometimes those tears are not addressed and those actually, the, the blood, uh, the bleeding that actually occurs from that ACL reconstruction, the cells that are, that are present within the blood actually go and they, they can heal that meniscus. An isolated, unstable meniscus tear will not heal. They're either, you know, what I tell people is they're either going to stay the same or they're going to get worse. Now, people's perception of whether or not they've healed or not, that's, that's maybe what, what's out kind of in the, in the common knowledge. Um, in other words, you may have a meniscus tear that hurts. You hurt it. It hurts for three or four weeks. And that, those symptoms then eventually go away and they never, they don't come back for years down the road, so you assume that that meniscus tear healed. Later on down the line, you have another injury, you kind of forget about what happened before, you go see the doc and you have a meniscus tear, and it probably happened in the same spot. That's a very common, um, that's a very common occurrence. The violence that occurs of the knee, in other words, that trauma that occurs from that ACL tear, it's pretty significant. I mean, most of the times people watch a player go down and they look like they just may have twisted their knee, 
But if you look at a, an ACL mechanism, in other words, how an ACL tears, it's a rather violent occurrence. And I showed you that picture of RG3 and how his knee was really buckling down. In that split second, you don't see that. But when you, when you go frame by frame in terms of what's going on with that knee, that knee really displaces significantly. Because of that, obviously those meniscus, the menisci are, are cushions within that knee joint, and there's a major shift in that knee joint itself, which then can tear that meniscus. So the meniscus in an ACL, um, a meniscus tear, whether it's the medial meniscus or the lateral meniscus, are actually very, are, are relatively common. I think do, being sport, either you choose to be an athlete or you don't. So I, I know that sounds kind of, kind of, I don't know, maybe blunt, but um, I mean, you think if you're an athlete your whole life, then you know you're, you've kept your body in shape and you've you've done all these great things for your for your health, but at the end of the day, it it's at the detriment of the joints that carried you through all those exercises. So. I always, I always try to tell people that if they're, if they're focused on fitness and they want to maintain that fitness, then a good idea is cross-training. And across, what cross-training does is it allows some impact activity, some lighter activity, and then actually some low impact activity. So if you're training, then if, you, if you're a runner, then take a few days off from running during the week and actually get on a stationary bike. Uh, if you're a, uh, if you a hiker, the same type thing. Get off the knees a little bit, uh, and and give them a break every once in a while. And I think, I think if there's a way to preserve the joint, that would probably the, be the most recommended thing to do. Is just to do some cross training. Scientifically, there's no benefit to a brace at all. In other words, if you look at studies that have evaluated the functionality of a brace to prevent injury, um, there's, really no, there's really no true scientific data that says it does prevent. There is a one little exception to that, and that's actually an offensive lineman where the braces that they use uh, actually decrease their risk of what we call MCL tears, which is another ligament in the knee that we, that we didn't talk about tonight. Um, so other than that, what the brace really does, and the, and the reason why it helps, is it provides a positive feedback mechanism from the joint, which being the knee, back to the brain. So it, it gives the athlete a sense of where their knee is in space and allows them to have better muscular control uh, of that specific extremity, um, which then gives them the feeling of, of more stability in the knee. <laughs> That's a good question too. And the reason why I kind of chuckle is because I've done an ACL tear on a, I've done an ACL reconstruction on a 78 year old Alpine skier that he sent me a picture uh, seven months after, eight months after, I should say eight months, eight months after his uh, ACL reconstruction uh, over in the Alps and said, thanks Dr. Brown. So it really depends on the individual. I'm just going to be, I mean, that's, that's kind of clearly the, the issue is, is, is how active is the individual? The other thing is, is how much arthritic change is in the knee? If we're dealing with a knee that has an ACL tear, um, that the knee is otherwise has global, in other words, arthritis throughout the knee itself, an ACL reconstruction is probably not going to do you much, much good. Um, but if you're 55, 60 years old and kind of, uh, you know, you're still athletic and you're at minimal degenerative change and you're out playing tennis one day and you, and you tear your ACL, I think it's a very reasonable thing to do to, to have an ACL reconstruction. In general, it's usually a younger patient population that we're, where we're doing the ACL tears, um, ACL reconstructions, and that's just a reflection on uh, their um, the intensity of the activities in which they uh, in which they participate. Again, there's no good scientific data that says that. What I tell people um, when they ask me that question is I think it gives people about as good, maybe a little less uh, benefit than that what a standard anti-inflammatory medication does. I think its biggest role is not necessarily um, uh, supporting the, su is not the right word, it's not necessarily making that cartilage more robust. Uh, it actually just acts as a bit of an anti-inflammatory 
uh, to the knee. That being said, um, I highly recommend the, the over-the-counter over nutraceuticals. Uh, that's what there's no FDA approval on those, but I, I do think that they offer some benefit to the individual. So at the end of the day, they don't hurt, and if they, if they help, then certainly by all means, I, I would encourage their use. There's the, 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 the little hole in front of those braces simply um, make that knee brace a little bit more comfortable. It gives the kneecap a place to, to live, so to speak. The, the other ones uh, are tighter and can actually constrict the motion of the, uh, of the patella, which can cause a, a different type of pain. That's more anterior knee pain um, from the, the, uh, the joint between the, the kneecap and the femur bone. So in general, the, the, the neoprene knee sleeves, um, the ones that do have the hole in front of the knee are a bit more comfortable. Um, if it's more just of a, a cloth or elastic uh, type of brace or sleeve, then, and then those generally don't need a, a hole in the center. It depends on the age of the patient, uh, where that tear is. A lot of these tears, if you, if you, when, you put the when you put the arthroscope in, in the knee and you look at that specific tear, um, the, the tear may look like it can be repaired, but the blood flow to that meniscus is just, it's not there. So as many sutures as, as we try to put in there, eventually that meniscus repair is going to fail and you'll be back in there uh, trimming that tear out and, and you know, another surgical procedure will be necessary. So it has to have, the age of the patient is important, um, the, the location of the tear and the quality of the meniscal tissue itself uh, all come into play when, uh, when we decide whether or not to repair or to trim out a meniscus.